Well, before we, we jump in, I, I want to share something with you. And I don't know who needs to hear this. I think the whole church needs to hear this. But there might be some of you individually that, that this might just be, be a benefit to. I, I want to share something that I wrote in my journal this week. And yeah, I, I keep a journal. It's a cool thing to do. Because it's a prayer journal. And without it, and here's why it's a big deal. Without that, you have no way of, of going back and just seeing how faithful God has been in your life. Unless you have a way to really record those moments. And, and sometimes I just record as I'm, as I'm reading, as I'm praying. If God puts something in my head, I'll just write it down. And, and that's what I'm about to share with you. Something that as a, I wasn't even reading the, this particular verse or anything like that. God just popped it into my head and I wrote it in my journal because I, I think it's just something that we need to hear. Go back about two and a half years ago, February 2020. The world was relatively normal in that time. Most none of us would have any idea what was about to just kind of be unleashed on our culture, on, on our lifestyles. You know, most of us had never heard at that point of a coronavirus or COVID-19 or if you did, it was somewhere in another country. It wasn't a big deal to us. And then suddenly, about two and a half years ago, that, that landed here. And our world shifted. Our world changed. But if you remember, a, a, lot, a lot of times people were, they were concerned, but they were willing to do whatever it took to, to help out each other. Well, we had teachers that had to pivot. And suddenly, they weren't in-class teachers anymore. They were computer home teachers. Something they weren't trained to do. And then a whole lot of you whose, whose kids normally went to school, now their school was at home, something you didn't plan for. And that had to be accommodated for. And, and people were willing to, to serve one another in different ways. People were willing to, to help each other out because, you know, we thought this will just be a short-term thing two and a half years ago. And some of you, it turned into a positive timeline in your life because some of you got engaged or re-engaged being part of God's church during that season in your life. But um, probably almost every one of us can name people that the opposite happened. People that were formerly active in church during that season, during this time that we've been in, disengaged and pulled back, and they haven't been back since. And, you know, it's just, it's a lot of emotion a lot, of, a lot of heartache. Some of you have lost jobs. Some of you ha have lost people that you care about during the last two and a half years. And, and here's the verse God gave me. Just as I was just kind of writing, as I was praying, and this isn't going to be on your screen or anything. This is, just, this is just extra. Galatians 6, 9 says this. It says, Let us not grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time... We will reap the harvest if we do not give up. Because it was so easy for, for people to say, look, I lasted for six months, and, and then I just kind of, I'm, I'm done with everything. Or it's been a year, or it's been two years, or it's been two and a half years, and I'm just sick of everybody. I'm sick of the rules. Uh, I'm sick of people telling me what I can wear, where I can't go, how long I can stay there. Uh, I can't even go to the doctor without jumping through all these hoops. And I'm just tired of everything. And, and so I, I'm telling us as a church, let us not grow weary in doing good. For we will reap a harvest at the proper time if we do not give up. It's just like these the same Israelites that we're about to talk about. After they received the Ten Commandments, God brought them to the very threshold of what's known as the Promised Land. And, and these are the same people that had seen God part the Red Sea. They had seen God bring them out of slavery in Egypt. They had seen God deliver them. They had seen God send down manna from heaven every single day except on the Sabbath, which the day before they got double dose. They had seen God do all those things, 
And then they get to the very edge of experiencing the promise that God had set everything up for. And they got scared. They let fear take over. And they missed out. For 40 years, an entire generation did not get to experience the fulfillment of God's promise because they gave up too soon. And so I just wanted to, to open with that. Just say, look, whether that, whether that applies to, to you in your personal life, don't quit, don't give up. God hasn't forgotten you. There's going to be a good outcome if you just hold on. God's plan is unfolding. It always is, because God is God, and God doesn't fail. Now, now, we fail, but God doesn't. So don't give up. Don't quit. Don't, don't quit on your, in your personal life. Don't quit on God's church. Remain faithful. Don't feel like anything we're doing is wasted, because it, it's, none of it is. It all matters. You matter. And we will reap God's harvest if we do not give up. So that's my, that's my public service announcement for the day. Uh, just, I just wanted to share something God shared on my heart this week. And if, if, if you needed that, wonderful, because I did. Now, now we'll step back into the Ten Commandments. We'll, we'll, we'll jump back into what we're talking about. We're in week two of walking through the Ten Commandments. And just kind of a, as a review, last week we talked about how, the Tim, how God gave his people these Ten Commandments. See, the first four that we talk about are all about man's relationship with God. The first four commandments are dealing with how we relate to God. He's going to say, you know, don't have any other gods before me. Don't worship idols. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Don't take God's name in vain. Those kind of things are how we relate to God. The last six are how we relate to each other. And the, the, the reason that God started with how we relate to him, because if we get that wrong, the rest of it doesn't matter. If we can't get our relationship with God right, we'll never be able to get our relationship with each other right. And so it always starts with, what we do with God. Where do we put God in our life? Because if he's not first, he's not at all. He can't be second. He just can't. The temptation for humanity, since the Garden of Eden, since sin entered the world, has always been to have a God that we can manage, that works for us. You got whole religions built on the fact that I can name it and claim it. I can ask God for anything I want, and he's obligated to do it. That's not in the Bible. Because, and one of the things, when we start talking about this idea, what we're going to talk about today, about not having any idols, especially physical images that, that we somehow give worth to, that, that we make an idol in our lives. Some people struggle because we can't actually get a, a picture of God. You know, some people really struggle with the idea of God, this kind of abstract idea that God is everywhere, God knows all things, but he's also personal. But some people struggle with that because they can't wrap their minds around that an all-knowing, all-powerful God can also be intimate and personal because I can't see him. And, and some people have talked about, no, you, you, just because you can't see it doesn't mean he's not real because you can't see the wind. You see the effects of the wind. You, you can see what the wind does when it comes by really fast, but you can't actually see wind blowing. But that doesn't mean it's not there. And the same goes for God. Just because you can't actually see God visibly in this room doesn't mean he's not here. Doesn't mean he's not working. Doesn't mean he's not in the world. And in the New Testament actually answers the question when they talk about what does God look like? What, what do we know about God? 
Look, look what it says in Colossians 1.15. He's talking about Jesus. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But look at what it says in, in Colossians 1.15. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. So when anybody ever asks you, well, how do you know what God looks like? You say, Jesus. Well, that's the Sunday school answer. But in this case, it's right. That's what God looks like. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. And one day when we get to heaven as believers, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see Jesus. And that, that's God. But as we, as we dig into the, the second of the Ten Commandments, just, just to, to give you a little overview, the Ten Commandments were not given to, quote-unquote, save people. Nobody gets to God because they keep the Ten Commandments. That's not spirituality. That, that's not salvation or anything like that for people. Because it's impossible to be saved simply by keeping the law. That's not what the law does. So why did God give us this? What, what's the purpose? And, and here are some of the reasons that God gave these Ten Commandments. That all the other laws flow out of these, but these are the big ten. And the first one is this, is to reveal some of who God is and his character and his holiness and his glory. See, all of these commandments always point back to God. They, they are a reflection of who God is. And then the second reason, we, we just talked about it, it's to hold up that mirror to reveal our own sinfulness. See, the Ten Commandments don't save you, but what they do is reveal to you that you need to be saved. Another reason God gave them to his people is to mark Israel to make it clear that they are his people and he will be their God to separate them from the other nations back then. And, and as we're going to see today, there, there are some specific reasons for that. And to, to give his people a standard for righteous living so that they could enjoy the freedom that comes from living not under prison rules, under shackles, but there's freedom in the boundaries that God gives. See, a lot of people, unfortunately, think that God is this, this just mean old man with a beard that lives on a cloud somewhere, and he's ready to strike people down the, the moment they step out of line. He's, he's like a prison guard or some kind of warden. The, the moment you don't toe the line, that's it. You get what's coming to you. And, and that's not what God is. It's kind of like those of you that are parents. You know that, hey, if you've got a, a nice backyard that your kids can play in that is fenced in, then you can say, hey, y'all can go play in the whole backyard. You can run around. You, you can do whatever you want in that backyard. Why? Because it's protected by the boundaries. Whereas if you didn't have a fence, you couldn't just turn your kids loose in the backyard because they might end up in places that you wouldn't know where they were and you wouldn't want them to go. But there's freedom in those boundaries. Well, that's what the, the Ten Commandments do for us. They provide the freedom for us to live well. Not, not under oppression, not being limited, but just for us to experience the best of life. That, that's why God gave them to us. And, and for Israel, it also points back to the coming of his Savior, the coming of Jesus one day. One of the reasons that he gave them. It goes back to what we talked about last week, the difference between the law and grace. See, in the Old Testament, people were under the law. They came to faith by keeping and observing the law, the law of Moses, which is what we're talking about here, the Ten Commandments. But see, one of the things the New Testament tells us, that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, he came to fulfill the law. See, the law points us to our need for a Savior, and Jesus, by his grace, finishes that job of saving us. And, and they go together. So let's look what it says. Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 4. This is the second commandment. Look what it says. It says, You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens 
or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commandments. See, God, he, he told them. You know, the, the first commandment was, have no other gods before me. And that didn't mean that you could have as many gods as you wanted as long as there were none ahead of me. It really means you have no other God besides me, period. I'm it. God, God is the only one. He's not one of many. He is the one. And over here, he's telling them, and do not make any images of, of anything, whether something you can see or something you made up in your mind. And, and we're going to see why in just a minute. Because... One of the things God was not doing here, God created the pe people to be artistic and creative. God is a very creative God. And God loves expressions of the gifts and talents that he gave us. When he created the, the temple, the tabernacle for Israel, he created it with all kind of decorations and statues and, and other things, pieces of art that reflected back on him. He doesn't have a problem with that. The problem is when we begin to worship those pieces instead of worshiping the God who allowed those pieces to be created, that's, that's when it turns into idolatry. He's not anti-art. And so don't think anything like that. But see, God expects people to worship the creator, not created things. If we can create it with human hands, it's not God. God is, is way too powerful, and, and God can't be constrained into an image that you and I can create, whether it's made of gold or it doesn't really matter what it's made out of. And one of the things that I want to kind of hit pause here, a, a lot of people struggle with, you know, verses 4 and 5, because it, it almost seems like God is saying, hey, I'm going to punish generations and generations for the sins of the parents here. But that's not what God is saying at all. Look, look what it says in Deuteronomy 24. This, this is, some of this is where this is coming from. But look what it says. It says, Parents must not be put to death for the sins of their children, nor children for the sins of their parents. Those deserving to die must be put to death for their own crimes. Okay. So, Seeing that, now I want to take it back to these verses we just read in Exodus chapter 20. So God is not saying, hey, parents, if you mess up, then I'm going to punish your kids down to the three and fourth generation because of what you did. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, parents, you have such a responsibility that if you lead your family astray and to worship other things, most likely they're going to continue that practice and their kids are going to continue that practice. And so because you started them down a bad path, then generation after generation is going to be impacted ultimately and they're going to make wrong choices because you taught them to make the wrong choices and they're going to pay the consequences for that, for their sin that they learned from you. That's what he's saying right there. That's why he's saying, parents, you have such a great, huge responsibility of bringing truth into the next generation. And, and, and we talk about this a lot. Here at Marshall Road, we are all about the next generation. We, we want to see our students, we want to see our kids raised up in the faith to, to know their faith, to own their faith, not just to say, well, yeah, I, I do whatever my parents tell me to do and I don't really know anything about it. It's just something that, you know, I went and got baptized and didn't understand it, but somebody told me I should do that, so I listened. No, we want them, when they graduate high school, to know what they believe and why they believe it because when they get out there, when they get to college, when they start working, it's going to get challenged. People are going to want to know, why do you think that? Why do you do that? Why do you spend so much time at that church? Does it do anything for you? And we want people to be able to give an answer. And guess what? 
in two hours a week at the church, that's going to give them about this much of an answer. Now, the other 170 plus hours of the week that they're with you is going to give them a real big view of what that is. That's why parenthood is such a great responsibility, or in some cases, grandparenthood, because you know the family situation is, is, is different for a lot of people. But th this is a huge deal. But that's why God doesn't end it with saying, if you do wrong, here's how many, it's not just going to impact you, it's going to impact generation after generation. But that's why I love verse 6. He says, I will lavish my unfailing love on those who seek after me, who follow me, who trust me, who, who put me first in everything. See, that's God's real desire. God wants to bless his people. But here's the thing. It's God's terms of what the blessings are, not yours. It, it doesn't mean monetary blessing. It doesn't mean job blessing. It means life blessing. And if you're close with God, you want what God wants. And God wants to give you what God wants to give you. And those things can go hand in hand. And then you experience the fulfillment of life that God talks about. Even when life is hard, you can have joy because you know you're right where you're supposed to be. You're in your sweet spot. You're right where God has you. And you trust him. You say, God, look, I may be going through a hard season, but you brought me here. And so obviously you have a reason for doing this. And I put you first and I trust you in this. So I'm not going to run away from you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. I'm going to lean more into you even during this hard season because only you have the strength to get me through it. And that, that's what God is trying to, to teach us with some of these verses. And part of the reason he started with these is because they were settling into a nation. They had come out of Egypt where they had hundreds of gods, you know, gods for the weather, gods for the stars and all kind of stuff. And then they were moving into the promised land where all the, the people that already lived there, all the different nationalities and ethnicities that made up the, the land of Canaan, they were idol worshipers. They had false gods. And so Israel was going to be just surrounded by people who put their faith in all these false gods. And so unless they set their standard in advance and say, no, we don't have anything to do with those false gods. We serve the, the one true God, the God who delivered us out of Egypt, the God who makes all things possible. Because here's the thing. What Satan does, what the enemy does, is he makes idolatry look attractive. Otherwise, it wouldn't be tempting. Because you can make anything an idol. It, it doesn't have to be a, a tangible thing that, you know, you don't have to wake up every morning and bow down to your mic stand. I know, I know that may, you know, some musicians may like that, but that, that's not a thing. It doesn't have to be something that you visibly can see. I mean, you, you can have an idol in your heart. You can have an, an idol just in, in the things you pursue in life. Anything can become an idol. And I want you to understand why they're so attractive. Why are we so tempted to put, kind of push God to the side so easily and turn to something else when we know God is God? And we've given our lives to God as believers. Can you believe that? We've actually, if, if you're a Christian, you said, God, I believe you died on the cross for my sin and that I believe you rose again. And I believe that one day when I die, I'm going to join you in heaven for all of eternity. And I trust you with that completely. But please don't ask me to trust you with my job. Because that's asking too much. It just, it, it, it doesn't make sense that we'll trust God with our eternity, but we won't trust him with the next five years of our lives. But that's what we do. And, and here's, here's some of the reasons why. That God has to warn us so much how he had to warn his people to be careful with idol worship. Here's some reasons that it's so tempting, so attractive. The one, for one, it was supposedly guaranteed to work. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, back then, 
they believed that if they created that statue, that the presence of that God would go begin to dwell in that statue. And the power of whatever God that, that they were talking about would function and flow out of that statue. It would become a conduit. So if you're talking about the, the God of fertility, that whatever figurine represented that, then if that's what you wanted done in your life, you would pay whatever offering and sacrifice to that God and then get the result that you wanted from that God. Now, we know that didn't always work, but that can be chalked up to a whole lot of reasons. The main one being that that was fake and that God's not there. But if you really want something to hold on to, and somebody comes along and says, no, we, we trust Yahweh, the, the main, the God, the God that created everything. And somebody says, no, my God is Asherah. And he's on that pole right there. I can see that. I can touch that. And that's why it's so deceptive. Because it sounds so much easier to say, okay, my God is that, that thing right there that I can see that's tangible to me. Not this big, big God that I don't really, can't really experience. Or I can't touch. Or I can't see. You're trying to get me to, to put my trust in something. It's much easier for me to trust in that thing that's right there in front of me. And that's why this is so tempting for people. Because it's so easy for us to say, look, you talk about trusting God and you struggle financially. I'm a multimillionaire and I don't, I don't believe in God and yet I'm blessed and you're not. Why would I want what you want? Is God just going to take all my money? And, and that's, a, that's a crazy example, but that's how the world thinks. If we put our trust in the wrong things. But that, that was one of the things. that it's, it's guaranteed to work. One of the other attractions is that it is purely selfish. And, and kind of like what we've already talked about. Back then, the whole system of idolatry, the, the way they did things was that these gods, and, and, and it blows your minds when you think about it, but these gods could do anything in the world except feed themselves. So they were God, in theory, but they couldn't feed themselves. So that's why that was the one sort of hold that human beings had over these gods, these false gods, is that they couldn't feed themselves. So if you wanted something from them, you would make a sacrifice of food, and you'd prepare it a certain way, and that god, little g, fake god, would receive that food because it couldn't feed itself. And now it would be obligated to respond to whatever it is you asked for. Um, and it, if you did that correctly and you did it well enough, then that God would owe you. And so then you could kind of turn in that, trade in that IOU with that God and say, okay, I gave you what you wanted. Now you do this for me. That was the mentality. That was the culture. Now, as crazy as that sounds, it, not much has changed. We, we may not do it literally with a food offering, but a lot of us think that way about things. Well, you know, I'm owed this. I've sacrificed this. And so the world owes me. Society owes me a debt because I, I did this. Because we still live in that, that kind of selfish idolater mentality the, the third reason that so many people fall prey to this is not just because it's all about us it's because it's easy it, it just really is simply easy to say hey it's not really about anything that I do I can do whatever I want I can live as messed up as I want to live, I, I can you know, li live as selfish a life as I want. And all I have to do to wipe the slate clean is to, to make this little peace offering with this God. And he's obligated to, to start me over. And there is no moral responsibility. 
And that was where our culture begins. As you see it in the Old Testament, you see it in the New Testament. In the book of Romans, it says, the Bible says, they, God gave them over to their sins. And the scary thing is, we're, I think we're seeing a lot of that in our own culture today, where we just see at some point God just says, look, if, if y'all want to go down that road, I'm going to let you, and you're going to suffer the consequences for it. That, that's a scary place to be when, you, when, when that gets said about society like it did in Rome before Rome fell. God gave them over to their sins, to their sinful behaviors. Another reason that for Israel this was such an attractive thing, because as I said before, this was the common, normal way of religious activity back then. Before Israel came along and said, we have a covenant with Yahweh, the one true God. Everybody worshipped multiple gods, hundreds or even thousands of gods. Gods for the weather, gods for health, gods for work, gods for satisfaction, gods for pleasure. There was one. I think in the New Testament, and I may have this number wrong, there were over 16,000 gods in some different nations we read about in the New Testament. They had gods for everything. And so if, if I'm an Israelite and I'm supposed to live in covenant with the one true God and then I go to a, a move into an area where I'm surrounded by people who are very successful in their farming, in, in their livelihoods, and I say, hey, we're new to the area. How do I get where you are? And they start telling me, well, it starts with making offerings and praying to this particular God that provides the the crops and the nourishment and nutrients to help the crops grow. If you want your crops to grow and you want to be a successful farmer, you got to start with this God. And so that was the normal thing. And so unless God's people were intentional of saying, no, that's not what we do, it would be real easy for them to fall into that trap. And of course, we see them doing that over and over and over throughout the Old Testament. They move into an area and they immediately get sucked in to the false gods and the religious lifestyles of that area, and they walk away from the one true God. The devil knew that if he wanted to get people away from God, he had to make it as self-gratifying as he possibly could. I mean, think about it. God says... If you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. God says, hey, the last will be first, and the first will be last. If you want to be first, make yourself last. Completely contrary to everything the world says. And then these false gods come along, and, and their disciples say, hey, you can have whatever you want. Just follow us. And you'll be healthy. You'll be wealthy. You'll have success. Your family will be great. Everything you ever wanted can be yours if you act now. And it's no wonder so many people get sucked into this. But that's why God started here. He said, have no other gods before me. He said, make no other idols not a physical idol, not a mental idol. Because he said, if you do, if you walk away from me, it can have severe consequences generations down the line. Because chances are, if you as a parent, if you as a family leader walk away from me, your kids and their kids are likely to walk away from me as well. And God says, please don't do that. Please stay aligned with me. You know, we're in just a moment, we're going to sing. And, and we've talked about some, some heavy stuff this morning as we've dug in. But I wanted you to understand, while we're walking through this, it's more than just thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. And there's a why behind everything God said, and these whys matter. Because if we understand the why, it'll make everything make more sense. 
if we understand the why that God gave it to them, that'll help us apply it to us now. Because truthfully, not a whole lot has changed culturally. Technology's increased. But as a society, we, we haven't made a lot of progress since he gave these out. And it's scary. And it's sad. It's all the above. One day, we'll get there. How do I know that? Because Jesus is going to make it happen. And if you're not aligned with Jesus when that day comes, help you. I mean, that's all we can say is God help you. One day, God is going to say it's time. Call him up. And then it'll almost be too late for a lot of people. People that have lived a life of fixing their eyes on everything but God. And God's going to say, yeah, I never knew you. And therefore, you're going to bear the weight of those choices. And that's why what we do as a church matters so much. Because there's people in your life, there's people in your circle, in your world, who right now are living a life apart from God, and they're headed for an eternity separated from God. And if you don't want that to happen, God might be wanting to use you to show them a different way. Say, it's time you understand the truth, that the world and everything in the world is never going to satisfy you. You can accumulate as much money, as much success, more than you ever dreamed possible, and at some point it's going to feel, it's going to be empty. It just is. Because we weren't designed to measure ourselves by the world's standards. We were created with an understanding that there's something more out there. And if, if somebody says, I choose to ignore that, I choose to say there is no God, they have that right. That doesn't make it true. We know, some of you know from experience, that you will never find fulfillment in anything else until you finally let go and let God in. And then you'll find the peace and the joy and the fulfillment that you've been looking for. Does that mean life will get easier? Of course not. Life is hard. They crucified Jesus. So they're going to try to hurt us too. The, the world is going to throw everything it can at us as believers to try to get us to take our eyes off God and to put our eyes on our circumstances and to walk away from God and say, God, I, I gave you a chance and you let me down. You dropped the ball and I'm done with you. That, that's what the enemy wants. And God says, just persevere. Trust me even when it's hard. He said, don't go grow weary in doing good. For you will reap a harvest at the proper time if you do not give up. And that's a God harvest, not a, not a personal selfish harvest. See, nothing about the Bible is meant for us to take for selfish reasons. That, that's the wrong motivation. It's the wrong interpretation for anything we read in Scripture. It, it's, it's not about what makes me happy. It's not about what makes you happy. And you can't read the Bible saying, what's, what's in this for me? Because the Bible wasn't written about you. The Bible is 100% about God. It points back to God. It brings glory to God. It's a testament of God's love for us. We're, we're not part of the story of the Bible in terms of, except we're on the receiving end of everything God did. That's it. Our contribution is that because of our sinful nature, we need everything to be done on our behalf. We need what only God could do. So right now, we're getting ready to pray, and we're going to sing, and we're going to close our time together. And something may have been said today that kind of made you start thinking that there maybe there's more to this whole God thing than, than you thought. Or maybe it's time that you stop trying to, to do everything yourself, yourself and let God in. That you know that you've been on the throne of your life for far too long and it's time to let the right person there. And that's God. 
And if you want to do that today, if you want to find out how you can become a follower of Christ, how you can put Jesus on the throne of your life, then while we're singing, I'm going to be standing up front. You just come up there and tell me, hey, I'd like to talk to you about this. And then we'll take it from there. And we won't leave till you get all your questions answered. That's why we're here is to introduce people, to connect people with God. So they can experience the kind of life God has for them. So let's pray and then we'll sing. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what, just what it teaches us when we take the time to just look closely. And I pray now that nobody would leave this room, nobody would turn off their live stream without knowing for certain where they stand with you. So Lord, this is your invitation. May we respond with a yes to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.